Walaikum salam, Ustaz Artan. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm here. Um, I don't have uh, the. Uh, I'm, I'm here like a. Participant, okay. I think. Yeah. Apologies, just one moment. Okay, you have to un um, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah, you have to um, make the video available as well because you yeah. want to let and un unblock it because it's just... oh. Okay, excellent. I'm a co-host now. Okay, brilliant. Finally. Alhamdulillah. Technology. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, we apologize for the delay, uh, some technical difficulties, uh, but alhamdulillah, we are here now. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, is everybody able to hear okay? If one person says they can, then that means the rest are fine. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you for yes. your patience. Um, yes, we're ready yes, to, to um, <laughs> kickstart. Jazakumullah <laughs> khair uh, for joining us. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share uh, the slides for today. So we have to take it right back. Okay, so uh, welcome to this very exciting event. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we're really grateful that you guys are here joining us. Uh, we'll start straight away because of uh, the little bit of delay that we've had. So to begin with, I just want to remind everybody that this is um, streamed live, Alhamdulillah, on YouTube. So the link that is in the chat box can be shared with other family, friends. And they can also tune in on YouTube if they can't access the Zoom link. And I wanted to uh, just inform you a little bit about MEND. Uh, so this event is brought to us um, with a collaboration that involves MEND as well as uh, Anajashi and Emka. Uh, so for those who don't know, MEND stands for Muslim Engagement and Development, which is a 100% community funded organization. And it seeks to empower British Muslims across the UK to tackle Islamophobia. And inshallah, that will happen by getting involved in media and in politics. That's the first thing that we want to say. Uh, the second thing we want to say about MEND is you can find um, MEND on all of the uh, kind of major uh, media platforms. So there's a link to Twitter page, Facebook, on YouTube, and so on. And you can get involved as well as stay updated about what's currently going on. And if you'd like to get involved, then we encourage you to please uh, start by maybe volunteering. And that will involve you just quickly going onto the MEND website, which is on the, on the screen there, um, filling out a form and then somebody will be in touch with you to see what you want to get involved with. And, you know, there's a lot of reward in it. Um, and we ask a lot to, to make us um, people who, who stand up for Islam and play a role. And the second way is for you to donate. Um, so MEND is actually, um, a campaign that or an organization that is 100% um, fund, um, non-funded, so it's a charity organization and your donations will go a long way, inshallah. And lastly, um, in a few days, it's going to be November. And for those who don't know, uh, November is Islamophobia Awareness Month. And by that, what we mean is, inshallah, uh, the month aims to kind of inform people and campaigns go on and things like that. And we aim to deconstruct and challenge the stereotypes about Islam and Muslims. Uh, the campaign, as we said, is held every month, every November, sorry. And it aims to work with stakeholders and community organizations to promote the positive contributions of Muslims in the UK. So please go onto the website. It's islamophobia-awareness.org. 
So we now come to our Ustaz uh, Muhammad Artan. Um, and you know, brothers and sisters, uh, usually when it's been, it's been introduced, uh, I would say he's a historian or a teacher or you know a researcher or somebody who's an imam in the community. But um, our Ustaz Muhammad Artan, um, he, he's mashallah, a man who wears many hats because he's involved in a lot of different things. And um, my opinion is that it's not impressive for you to do many things, but to do something uh, or to do many things really, really well, that's the, that's, that's the kind of incredible thing that um, we want to commend our brother for. So please allow me to tell you a little bit about our speaker. Um, so Ustaz Muhammad is a publisher, a videographer, he started as a student of Islamic discipline and, and, and a historian too. He was born in Somalia, raised in Netherlands, and now lives in England. He studied film and videography and for several years taught filming and editing. He was the founder of No Media Productions, a grassroots filming company that served as training and educational platform for film producers with the aim of simplifying videography for the disadvantaged members of the community, mashallah. He is now the director and founder of Loh Press. And Loh Press is a publishing company specializing in Islamic, African, and Somali, study, Somali studies. He studied and continues to study with a wide range of scholars and historians, and his interests intersect with Islamic studies, Islam in East Africa, and ancient um, East African history. And Ustaz Muhammad Atan is currently translating and annotating an upcoming classical Arabic text, which is known as Al Imam Bi Akbar Man Bi Ard Al Habasha Min uh, Islam. And that's as the knowledge about Islamic kingdoms in the lands of Northeast Africa. Um, and this work vividly describes geographic and political history. Eight and Muslim dynasties in the in the Horn of Africa, and you know it's it's really interesting because uh, maybe we we didn't actually know that there were eight uh, great African dynasties that that are Muslim, um, and it talks about this struggle for supremacy against the Amharic Christians Solomonic Empire um, occurring against. And this takes place in the Middle East. The work is first to be published from several Arabic manuscripts as a Christian um, um, fortress in the midst of a sea of Islam. Aside from his scholarly pursuits, his personal interests include traveling, reading, promoting uh, reading culture in general, um, nature, filming, and photography. He has toured globally and continues to tour his popular introductory course, which I took a look at uh, on YouTube as Tez, and I thought it was phenomenal, mashallah. Um, and the name of the course is Introduction to Somali History, Scratching the Surface. And when the Sheikh starts speaking, he can explain to you a little bit more about that, inshallah. Uh, Ustaz Muhammad Atan, we welcome you. Um, we welcome you from Mend, we welcome you from al -Najashi, from the brothers and sisters that are involved, and also a personal welcome from myself. Jazakallah kullu khair for joining us. I'll hand over to you now and allow you to uh, run your presentation, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Assalamualaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Am I uh, clear? Can you, can you hear me? Because, you know, we, 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 went, we went away and then we came back. So am yes. I loud, loud and clear? Yes, loud and clear. Alhamdulillah. And my, my connection is not that bad, being the like cream. Uh, do forgive me if my connection uh, uh, sort of becomes bad. Uh, we we live in a place called Little Mogadishu in, in, in Leicester. <laughs> and <laughs> although, although it's, uh, you know, in the heart of uh, East Midlands and everything, uh, sometimes you kind of have the um, third world, uh, <laughs> third world uh, <laughs> problems. <laughs> so I, have to, uh, I, I know I shouldn't be calling uh, back home third world, but yeah, that is the 
اصطلاح ذات اللانجوج اني واي ال كيك اوف ان ستارت ويز بريسينج الله سبحانه وتعالى هو allowed us to come together and to be here with one another and uh, remember and talk about the 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 the, the people who are gone uh, of the past the and, and and sort of remember and sort of reiterate uh, the qasas the, the stories of the past and this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done throughout the Quran so often that it has been uh, quantified by scholars who are experts in the Quranic sciences to have said at least one third of the Quran consists of an historical uh, narrative or historical anecdotes. So these qasas. And so we can see from there on uh, a book that has been revealed in, in, in the middle of the Hijazi Peninsula early on in, in somewhat uh, uh, the first quarter of the seventh century um, that, you know, majority of it actually consists of qasas if you segment it that way and the uh, and specifically the people that has been talking to uh, through this qasas were the people who were the most harshest uh, to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and early on his mission so these are uh, at the at, at the uh, uh, at the late stages of when he was uh, in mecca and then when he moved to uh, Medina. So between these two stages that the Prophet Sallallahu was about to leave Mecca and as well as when he entered uh, Medina in the first few years in Medina, these are some of the most uh, uh, them, some of the most uh, uh, historic narratives and anecdotes that are being told to the Prophet Sallallahu And one should wonder why, one should ponder and seek deeper meaning not only recite the letters that are on the uh, Musha, but rather should think about deeply why certain things happen, why certain things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, brings up certain thematic message in the Quran again and again and again, and what does it, what is it telling us? What is the context? And so a lot of these things are really important to understand in the Kareem, and we should uh, seek to understand it in a much more deeper way. And we can only do that um, if we're able to uh, think deeper, but also if we're able to think back as well. And that's why history and these classes are important. So anyway, uh, with, with that bit of uh, interlude, I'm gonna start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, for uh, this session and uh, everybody can sort of uh, yeah, who can see um, mashallah we can see a, a very well decorated slide Allah mubarak Allah mubarak <laughs> okay, uh, so yeah um, uh, and and basically what I wanted to uh, oh uh, sorry I need to go back and so what I wanted to um, make sure and that we understand um, uh, is that uh, the, the, the history of the uh, Najash, in, in essence, the history of the first uh, uh, monarch to have uh, embraced Islam, not necessarily just the first monarch um, uh, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of Africa, but also because that's what we have on the title, isn't it? We have on the title, it says the first monarch of, uh, the history of the first monarch of Africa, right? But in essence, what we're trying to say here is, uh, and understand is that actually he was the first monarch in, um, in, in Islam to have embraced and accepted uh, uh, the prophetic message, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And so we're going to cover a bit of about that. And hopefully I, sh I think everybody can see it. Uh, if there are any issues, uh, please do let me know. And so um, uh, a bit of context, uh, we talked about a little bit of uh, the, the historical um, uh, anecdote and historical importance of looking back at uh, the Quran uh, itself, right? So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in various places, and one of these verses here, is هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءًا مَذْكُورًا uh, was there not a period of time that when the man was nothing to be uh, of, spoken of, right? And so that is it is really important for us to understand that we we are a a, a collection 
of experiences that are either taught and, and retold or ignored. So it's one of those two things. And, and the role that we have played throughout our life determines what kind of people we are and what kind of impact we leave and sorry what kind of impact we leave and what kind of heritage uh, um, uh, we, that uh, sort of sustains our image mm -hmm. and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these uh, messages and uh, that obviously you know, despite the length of things despite how long things uh, pass right uh, it is not a matter of you being living a century ago, two centuries ago, but rather it is a matter of what have you done and what benefit have you brought to this uh, realm and this existence? And, and have you realized your, um, your, your purpose of creation, you know, uh, your purpose of creation where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, that I have not created mankind and, uh, sorry, the jinn and mankind except to worship me and some of the major mufassirin of the companions radiallahu anhum ajma'in have mentioned that uh here it alludes to uh, uh so i.e so that they may get to know me and they get to know me requires you actually doing more deeper investigation about yourself your environment uh, uh, the things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and his favors upon you and all of these things have a critical role to play when it comes to history. And the reason I'm emphasizing this again and again and again, and that the ulama has done in the past and uh, written and, and, and endeavored and, and, and sort of engineered the sciences is to show not only that the past has happened, something has, has happened, but rather why did it happen? How did it happen? And how is it relevant to us? What lessons can we learn from it? What is the ibar? And that's why Ibn Khaldun has this uh, beautiful kitab of history, which he called Kitab al ibar and, and the book of uh, uh, ponderance or the book of reflection in, in essence, that um, we have to think about what history teaches us. And it, it should be a tool of ponderance. It should be a tool of understanding, right? And that's why we're going to sort of kick off with this session of uh, uh, Al Najashi, the King of Kings of Northeast Africa, what is known as Ard al Habasha or Abyssinia or modern day, uh, 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 smaller part of modern day Ethiopia, because you know the landmass is much larger. So we're going to be covering uh, several sections around this. Uh, because obviously this is a huge subject and if anybody just looks at and consults the Islamic resources, the material that Muslims have written about uh, the man himself, Al-Najash, the king, as well as um, uh, the companions who lived there, the impact he had on, 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 on a prophetic mission, the uh, impact it had on the da'wah, the impact it had worldwide is huge. But I have not seen that anybody has uh, sort of written a concise and or, or even encyclopedic uh, um, work around what is the role that genuinely Ard al Habasha has played in terms of Islam. And that isn't something that we really need to understand. Okay. And so in this session, as we said, we're focusing on a specific uh, period of time and with with an individual in mind okay and so if we're doing that we cannot be holistic in everything else rather we will just try to cover a bit of uh, a, a prelude to what happened before he came to the scene and during his his reign and as well as the the sort of a heritage that he immediately leaves behind the sort of an impact that he has. And these are some of the things that we just talked about uh, when we just mentioned about the Quran in the in Allah Kareem. And may Allah allow us and gives us the tawfiq to, to do this successfully. So, and in section one, we're talking about pre-Islam. So we need to understand uh, when we say pre-Islam, what does that mean, okay? What does that mean? That means what was Ard al-Habasha like? What was Northeast Africa like? What was, uh, modern day uh, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, uh, uh, Ethiopia, what were they like, these parts of the world, what were they like at the time prior to Islam? And what were the kingdoms that ruled and what 
impact it had on the in, on the world uh, uh, in that essence. Specifically, looking at Jazeera uh, um, uh, um, Arab, and I see in the sort of the the Arabian Peninsula because that is where Islam comes from, and so we have to sort of assess and understand the link that these two had. Okay, so when we have to now start with the Aksumite Empire, and the Aksumite Empire has been a vast empire that um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, ruled a large section of the civilized world at the time, okay? And so the kingdom of Aksum sort of emerged uh, around about in the first century uh, AD, in the first century AD, uh, it's, and it covered huge landmass, right? And so this landmass uh, was not only what we nowadays call Ethiopia, Ethiopia, right? But rather, uh, it, it actually included, and uh, according to certain records, and and that's what that um, uh, uh, big uh, uh, stone will uh, show historically, that it actually covered uh, up uh, up to sort of South Sudan or or, or, or uh, element of East Sudan. It covered uh, Eritrea. It covered uh, 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 Djibouti. It covered northern uh, part of uh, uh, Somalia, what's now known as Somaliland, and seg segments of, of the eastern part of the Somaliland. And also um, it covered uh, what is now known as the traditional uh, borders, or, or sorry, the modern borders of Ethiopia. So all of that landscape is what uh, Aksum has covered. And so the, the historians, when they look at the first uh, impactful um, uh, uh, Najashi or, or, or a king that uh, we come to think of is uh, uh, the one that was known as Zoskalas and, or, and another name known as uh, Zahakala. And he lived around about, it's been said, the first century of CE, as we said, and he's left a, a written, rich written text on, on his campaigns and conquests that he went about and, 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 and the things that he did in terms of the Horn of Africa, right? And so he talks about and mentions that he conquered those who live in the midst of incest gathering uh, barbarians between great waterless plains, right? And so uh, this shows you that in effect or in essence that he um, himself were actually expanding his, his control so much so that he went to the places where he would be uh, traditionally not uh, the places that he would normally rule, right? And so that's why it's important that uh, we understand that and that we uh, come to realize that the land, when we think about land masses, we should just, should have a bit of a brain or a, a mindset that says, okay, I'm not looking at modern borders. So when we're talking about this history, so please think and erase your mind from modern borders. And so this is very far and wide. And I want to sort of illustrate here that early on, that these conquest uh, uh, missions that was happening and this uh, uh, sort of uh, spreading out things that was happening, it's been said that he went as far, uh, sorry, as north as, 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 as uh, modern day Sudan or part of Sudan, as south as Somalia. So that shows you a great, great landmass that he sort of uh, covered. And it's been said the water in, uh, waterless plains that he was alluding to and the instance gathering uh, barbarians that he was mentioning were the people that live modern day uh, Barbara up to uh, modern day uh, Pentland area. And that shows you it's been a really huge landmass. So it goes against the grain in the essence of the, the, the stories that we get to hear that these uh, historical uh, uh, lands and, and their people have been divorced from one another, have not interacted one another, have not uh, 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 ruled with one another, have not lived with one another. So that is a, something that we should just completely in the first instant, uh, removed from our psyche, okay? So Aksum developed uh, an urban culture and it was an, an advanced uh, peasantry, it's been said, and it, has a, a, it had an amazing uh, legal uh, system. It had a uh, beautiful uh, literature um, it had a, a territorial organizations and it had a variety of uh, institutions in terms of and when it comes to education and recording down and uh, the, the Aksumite uh, culture was expressed um, in, in Semitic languages, which is known as the Giyas language, 
which developed um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, from other uh, modern day Ethiopic uh, languages, Semitic languages. Okay, so and 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 some of these could be. Um, classed as modern day uh, Tigrinya and Amharic languages, okay? And so that is the, the predecessors of these languages would have been the, uh, what we know as, as a Giz. And, and Giz is somewhat uh, sort of a, uh, a dead language has been said, but uh, an element of it has been preserved, right? So the Red Sea was uh, an important trade route in antiquity. Uh, and it was something that has been used consistently for generations and millennia. Uh, up to nine, uh, up to 1498, that's when the Portuguese, uh, as well as the Spanish, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, conquest uh, started uh, coming to the scene, and they discovered uh, a different route uh, that was normally uh, against the traditional uh, Muslim routes of the Arabian Peninsula, the Red Sea. So they discovered. Uh, the route that was uh, basically through Western Africa, uh, south of um, uh, South Africa, Cape of Hope, and then that is the way they they went all the way to India and China and that sort of things. And so, once that uh, happened, the influence of that part of the world, the Red Sea, the Horn of Africa, as well as what we know as modern day Yemen, has decreased substantially. And that's when you see uh, the people that live in that part of the world, their influences decreases. Their their uh, presence in the world stage uh, decreases, and that's why less of a people start talking about them, and also more of a people start talking about them as some sort of a passive uh, people, where um, uh, uh, you know people come to, people give uh, things to, people teach, people trade with, and then a lot of slavery uh, um, as a consequence. But that has not always been the case. Okay, so the adoption of Christianity. Uh, by uh, a king uh, of the name, uh, or, or a Najashi by the name of Izana, around about uh, uh, mid uh, uh, fourth century, is um, uh, has been said is one of the first people who, or one of the first rulers of that part of the world who brought Christianity to the Horn of Africa. Obviously, there have been priests coming up and down. There's been people interchanging, people coming for trade, but in essence, when it comes to rulership, because rulers are what uh, transforms societies when it comes to um, uh, bringing the religion in a clear-cut mandate, right? And sometimes other people take religion on their own, but that is a, some, uh, a, a slow uh, uh, process. But the normal process that we know is when rulers take on a, 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 a religion, that is when it tends to uh, transform the society on wholesale. And so it's been said in around about 340, uh, uh, two brothers uh, that came from uh, uh, the Byzantine uh, kingdom uh, kind of arrived in Axum, okay, and uh, they started uh, spreading the Christian religion, and they were essentially the first officials who came and sort of translated uh, a lot of the Christian doctrine uh, in, in the Gears languages and then sort of spread. And so this is really important that we understand this because that shows you that early on, Christianity set root in uh, in what is modern day uh, Ethiopia or modern day um, uh, Horn of Africa, right? And the reason that this is important is we have to understand is that there is some sort of uh, um, uh, what we class as the Abrahamic uh, faiths that comes to the um, uh, comes to the landmass and sort of is spread. And it's really uh, interesting that. Uh, when with, uh, uh, that later on the form of message uh, changes. So when the Najash uh, uh, that received these brothers uh, dies and he passes the role and the throne back to his son, Izana, he, he is the one that makes it uh, official mandate and decree that Christianity becomes the official religious, doc uh, sorry, the official uh, state doctrine that people will adapt and so the uh, and it becomes more attractive for a lot of uh, people who would come later on and visit that part of the world. And so the Aksumite Church included into its uh, name uh, uh, the concept of uh, uh, Tawahido, which is a, 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 a Tawhidi uh, 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 or Tawhid in, in, in the Semitic languages, that it's meant to talk about the unity, right? 
because that is as a Muslim something that we can understand that we're talking about the unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a soul um, uh, as a, a one unit that is worthy of worship uh, with no past partners whatsoever and it's really interesting that uh, centuries later when uh, the Ethiopian churches uh, the Ethiopian church follows the uh, Egyptian church um, and, 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 and it brings this link of the um, uh, accepting a format that is contrary to what uh, was practiced um, in Rome, the Byzantine uh, uh, kingdom, shows clear cut that they actually did not want to go against this form of understanding and, and, and saying that uh, Jesus uh, uh, was not a, 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 a three in one type of thing. So this, this religious aspect of, of uh, the Trinity is something that early on the church has, the Ethiopic church or the Aksumite church has completely denied and showed uh, not to uh, actually uh, follow. And this is really important that we understand because it's, it allows um, a, a link of, of an identity, a unique identity to that continues later on down the line, which goes against the uh, 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 Roman uh, Catholic Church, okay? And so rejecting this decision, which the two nature of, 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 um, of, uh, of, of basically uh, uh, Isa alayhi salam or Jesus as a God or God figure and this type of concept, Made, makes it really important that the, the Coptic Church as well as the uh, Ethiopic Church stand on their own feet and as a unique outside of the uh, Roman Church, okay? And so they kind of uh, get cut off themselves from the wider Christianity that way, but also uh, they sometimes got uh, persecuted for having a belief system that was contrary to what the Roman Catholic uh, aspired to. So, um, and, and this is why uh, those people who believed otherwise always came to North Africa. You know, those monks, those priests, those people who actually believed in that this concept of uh, Tawahidi, that, you know, they left the, the influence of uh, the Roman uh, uh, church and then they ran and settled that part of the world. Now, so the Ethiopian uh, church gets cut off uh, from others and it sort of turns inwards and now chooses to evangelize others of the horn. And so it starts uh, campaigning in spreading Christianity within the horn, right? And so a lot of um, uh, the things that it does and, and movements that it makes, it, it's designed to spreading Christianity, but also designed to get a lot of wealth. And, and this is why in around about, um, uh, around about the uh, mid 530s, 520s, it has been said, an invasion happens, which is uh, designed to support the Himyari Christian kingdom of Yemen, okay? And it's really important that we understand this is what sets the scene for uh, the, 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 the Aksumite empire coming to uh, uh, South Yemen and establishing themselves there and spreading uh, uh, their influence, right? Okay, so uh, that's why then uh, Justin, who was the Byzantine emperor at the time in, in around about 530s, right? He asks uh, one of the uh, one of the archbishops in Alexandria, modern day Egypt, uh, to intercede with the uh, Aksumite king or Aksumite ruler to take actions against the kingdom of Hemyar and the kingdom of Hemyar, which is based in uh, Yemen, as we said earlier, was a Jewish kingdom. Uh, which ruled majority Christian uh, subjects. So the majority of the people tend to be Christian, right? Uh, the, but the rulers were tend to be Jewish kingdom. And so the Jewish royalties, they persecuted a lot of the people. And we have a uh, Quranic anecdotes and we have um, a Hadith and historic narratives that shows these persecutions and, and the things, some of the things that uh, the Hemiari kingdoms have done. And so this kingdom in Ethiopia or in modern uh, in, in, in modern day Ethiopia or Eritrea is what puts out this Aksumite powerhouse and pushes into uh, Yemen, but also to go against the um, uh, Persian influence because the Persians who uh, wanted to sort of push uh, towards the Christian lands has had to have a, a sort of a puffer zone. And that's why the Aksumite empire became that puffer zone. And so, 
then the, uh, uh, Justin urges uh, 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 Caleb uh, to, and, and he sends them a letter. He says, uh, by the Holy Trinity, he says, and swears to go forth, whether by sea or by land, and goes against these criminal Jews. That's what he calls them, because obviously, as we said, the Hemiara kingdom were uh, um, uh, uh, a royalty that was of a Jew descent, which ruled the majority Christian uh, 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 Sha'ab or, or people. And so they go and um, a force of around about 120,000 roughly men have been uh, recruited and uh, taken from what is modern day um, uh, Horn of Africa or Northeast Africa. That includes the whole landmass, that includes Ethiopia, includes Eritrea, includes Djibouti, includes what is known as Somaliland, as well as what is known now as a Puntland area within Somalia or Somalia proper, as they say it. And so these are the some of the things that happens and these people are uh, uh, um, uh, sent out to cross over to uh, Yemen and uh, rule over uh, Subhanallah. Uh, Yemen and and some of them actually perish, and this is again an historic history that has been recorded well. And they said because the Hemiaris they built a sort of a, 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 a barricade which uh, was designed to prevent the forces to land uh, effectively. And so some of the forces ended up going towards all the way to the south, uh, sorry, north uh, uh, Hejaz, which is modern day Jeddah and stuff. So they would have landed. Uh, modern day uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So some actually landed modern day Saudi Arabia, some landed in um, in modern day Yemen. And, and, and that is what some of the historians have mentioned and talked about. And that is how much of a, 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 a effort that has been put in to land uh, these forces. And so uh, they've conquered, they will become successful, they established themselves and uh, they, they managed to subdue the power of the Hemiari kingdom, and they killed the king. And now um, we have a, an individual, interesting individuals that get introduced to the scene. And that is by an individual by the name of Abraha. And so several decades later, the uh, um, uh, uh, having two, two type of uh, governors and generals, uh, Abraha uh, decides to uh, coup against the, the the guy who was sharing uh, or who was essentially uh, ruling on behest of the Najash, on behest of the king in Yemen. So he coups it, Abraha coups it, and he kills that man and he chases him out. And so the Najash at the time hears about that Abraha sort of cooped without, um, uh, uh, you know, without having to giving him a permission. And so the Najash at the time sort of sends him a letter which uh, um, uh, uh, um, sort of uh, Ibn Ishaq talks about. And so then once the Najash reads the letter, he says to him, uh, and he talks about him being very apologetic because Najash, he says to him, I'm gonna cut his uh, head off or I'm gonna cut his uh, forelock off. And so Najash kind of sort of uh, ceremoniously cuts a bit of his hair and takes a bit of sand, mix them together and sends with a letter to the Najash and apologizes and says, I really apologize, dear king. This is my head mixed with uh, the dirt I oversee on your behest. Both are below your feet. So uh, sort of very dramatically, very, very uh, uh, theatrical sort of, you know, saying, please, uh, you know, I was, I was um, sahib al-amr. I, I was the one who is more uh, uh, um, uh, adequately able to uh, take care of this, uh, or take care of the mission. And so the Najash allows him and so when the Najash allows Abraha to rule there, Abraha as a, some sort of an apology, as a, some sort of spread uh, Christianity of some sort of, to showcase that this traffic that is going towards Mecca, he decides, SubhanAllah, I want to make sure now that I want to uh, build something that expands Christianity and advances Aksumite trade network, right? And so he comes up with this idea uh, and to say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna build a palace. I'm gonna build a palace on for, on behalf of the uh, Najash, on the king in in in, in Aksum. But also, I'm gonna do it so that it attracts pilgrimage, it attracts money, it attracts influence. Okay. So he says, and he writes a letter to uh, the Najash at the time. He says, I've built it for you a church like it was never been built for, uh, before uh, a king before you. I'm not satisfied until I've uh, sort of diverted the Arabs' pilgrimage to it. 
so this is uh, a, 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 and sort of a, him beating his chest. And it's been said from various records. I think there's, uh, there are Greek records, there are uh, contemporary uh, um, uh, Yemeni records, there are contemporary um, uh, uh, chronicles. There are a lot of data that shows us that this uh, palace or this church uh, in essence, or this temple or, or whatever you wanna call it, uh, 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 or cathedral was very successfully and beautifully built in modern day Sana'a and it was very uh, luxurious. And obviously what happened, happened to it. Uh, some of the uh, uh, Arabs in, in Mecca and others heard about it and decided sort of uh, to um, detract from it. And we know through the uh, seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you know, the, uh, one of them defiled it. And so when he defiled it, um, uh, so uh, this angered, um, this angered uh, Abraha, but he did not immediately commit himself to attacking the 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 uh, the Arab tribe that actually have done that and uh, some of them actually send them gifts and letters in a, uh, in a very being very apologetic but he decided to calm down and he said okay I'm not going to do that and then later on another incident happened where now he decided subhanallah you know what I'm going to do I'm going to go attack that uh, uh, masjid and uh, that Kaaba that is in Mecca, and I'm gonna make sure it's off the face of the earth because if I cannot do that, then this will continue. And so his uh, cathedral was uh, 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 sort of uh, seen as in a light of, uh, in terms of a competition with, with, with the Kaaba, the masjid of uh, the Haram of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala later on tells uh, us the story of Surah Al-Fil or the elephant, which we will talk about later on down the line, that, um, uh, that, you know, that this man now equipped himself a force that has never been seen or the like has have never been seen in, 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 in Southern Arabia, uh, modern, day, uh, modern day Yemen, uh, as well as the Hejaz, equipped it with elephants uh, the, the size of um, uh, uh, giants. And so, you know, decided to march along and, 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 and destroy anything and everybody that came in his way. And it's been said a lot of these people that were part of his forces, again, were part of the people that were recruited from Northeast Africa. And the consist, majority of them consisted of people that are seen as Northeast Africans or people from Horn of Africa, people from Ethiopia, Eritrea, um, uh, Djibouti, and all these uh, modern states, right? And so their, their ethnicities and varieties of different ethnicities was reflected by that. And the majority were people that were from that background. So we should not get an image of thinking that when we think of Habul Fil, they were Arabs or they were uh, Yemenites they, or they were uh, people of, of Himyari kingdoms or remnants of the Himyari kingdoms and their, and their troops. No majority of the people that went there and that uh, were part of that was his forces, his people. Yes, there were Qabils and tribes and uh, Qabail that actually were aligned to him and, 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 and sort of accept, accepted him. But majority were not uh, uh, that, and so uh, so the conflict happened, and obviously what happened happened. Uh, and Ashab will feel, uh, as the Surah will feel, it tells us uh, that uh, you know Alam Tarakeef of Allah Rabbu Kabi Ashab will feel. Have you not seen that how your Lord dealt with the people of the elephant, and they got destroyed and everything else? And that is an image that we will have that once this. Uh, uh, different people from the Horn and different ethnicities and different background has been com completely shattered and destroyed. They kind of dispersed themselves and some went to um, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, sought to sell their trade, i.e. become part of that, um, become part of any army that would hire them. So they became soldiers of fortune. Some became slaves because that's what happens when you uh, on the losing side of history, you become you know, you, some of you enslaved and some went back and some went to trading and that sort of things. Okay. And so these different people from Ard al-Habasha uh, is, is being said that consists a lot of these uh, 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 different uh, varieties. And we can see from uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the scholars that, you know, that they mentioned that the land of Habasha and its, its, its distance is very fast. And the people live there are divided into many ethnic uh, types. And all, uh, and all these ethnic types tend to be 
all uh, black people. So this, these are varieties of people who came and sort of boasting uh, centuries later, a couple of centuries later about this incident once the blacks were seen as in, in, in a derogatory form, in a, in a bad light. This is what Al-Jahib uh, uh, speaks about, that uh, second century Hijri uh, scholar and, and linguist and, 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 and uh, the, the father of Balagha, they say, or Ilm Balagha. He, he is the one that later on says and boasting, we were the owners of Arab lands from Abyssinia up to Mecca and our rules were applied and obeyed, obeyed by all. We overcame Du Nuas, Du Nuas was the Himyari king, and we killed the uh, Himyari rulers, but you did not own our land. So this is a kind of a bit him beating his chest and talking about the superiority in that aspect from the people that he hails from. Because you have to understand the context that the society that in Basra, that uh, Al-Jahid lives, were highly racialized at the time. And there's a, 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 a sort of, the, the Zanj rebellion is, is in the backdrop of the, the rebellion of the Zanj, the black people who rebelled against the uh, Abbasid uh, uh, kingdom. Uh, people were seen as uh, uh, black, seen as a sort of a derogatory thing. And so he's writing from that perspective. So he's not writing as a, 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 a like a racist or something like that. He's writing from a perspective of saying, look, uh, you know, we, we had this uh, uh, um, history. So after Abraha passed away, uh, and he passed away, his eldest, uh, it's been said his eldest uh, son, Yaksum, took over the throne. And thereafter, uh, after Yaksum, uh, there's been said, uh, Masruq took over that. And Abraha's rule slightly short while after that ends. And so because obviously he died short while after that, the latest has been said inscription to survive from his reign uh, in Arabia is re roughly dated uh, in about uh, 558. Uh, uh, which is roughly six years after his expedition. So that shows six years after the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, roughly. So because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is um, uh, to be said that he was born uh, roughly that uh, time, time period. And so uh, now we're going to go and, and uh, see ourselves into the period of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he start spreading the da'wah okay when he starts spreading the da'wah and so what does that mean so we, before we get into when he spreads the da'wah we have to understand now that image of consistently many many people from north of africa or the northeast africa being present in mod in in in, in contemporary mecca to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Right, and so you will see the story about Bilal. You will see so many of so many people and individuals. Their story in there. Some being unfortunately slaves. Some being of, of people who trade. Some people uh, being professionals who uh, sell their uh, uh, um, a sort of profession, which is to fight and 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 be a, a fortune a soldier of fortune. You know, like we will see some of the other later on companions who were uh, um, uh, from northeast Africa from. Al-Habasha, that was. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then is born into a society in Mecca, as in essence, where hosts of people from Ard al-Habasha live and prosper. And some actually, it has even been said at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, there was a whole a quarter called uh, the quarter of the, uh, the Habashi quarter, meaning this is where people came and traded from the uh, um, uh, uh, clothes and they traded material, they traded product, they traded services. And this is what you, if you wanted things that came from Northeast Africa, or you wanted to trade with people from that part of the world, or you needed a uh, unique material that they were very good at, you needed to go to that quarter. You need to, you need, needed to go to that part of Mecca. And so that is the, pro the, 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 the landscape that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets born into a landscape of diverse mixture when it comes to the traditional Arab tribes that live there, whether that be the Quraysh or others, as well as the people that live there and they came for trading or, or had a basis there. And that's why you have to sort of understand the Prophet Sallallahu come to that um, uh, uh, landscape. And so, so what is the uh, um, uh, what is this word Al Najashi? What is this title, the King of Kings, right? So Najashi is a title that is, in essence, 
uh, in uh, Aksumite uh, uh, gives language, right? The, uh, the sort of uh, uh, dead language as it were. Uh, it's not really much of a spoken now. So th that is what it is. And it means the king of kings. And this alludes and this gives you an, an image that the king must have ruled over other kingdoms or other kings, as well as other fiefdoms, as, as well as other chieftains, as well as other uh, ethnic groups and clans. And these are some of the uh, narratives that you should uh, um, uh, look into when you want to understand why is uh, a Najash or why, where does that come from? Why is that uh, seen as, uh, as an emperor sometimes? Why is that seen as a king of kings sometimes? Okay, it is similar to what we uh, know as when we talk about Caesar, when we talk about uh, uh, Kisra, when we talk about uh, sort of um, uh, the, 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 the Persians in essence, okay? That is some of the stuff that we um, uh, understand. Can everybody hear me? Just quickly sound checking. Um, I know. Yes, Chef. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. So, um, so the Najash uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is known in the uh, Islamic uh, material as Ashama, okay? Ashama ibn Abjar, Ashama ibn Abjar. And in other sources, it's known as either Armah ila Gibis or um, Ila. So it's one of these two. So, so there is a various degree of uh, difference of opinions uh, when it comes to the scholars of history. And they talk about this and they say, okay, what was his real name? And this is, the, uh, in, a, in essence, sometimes maybe a travesty. And we will understand why that is a, a, a such a bad thing. But also not necessarily because we've kept the uh, information as Muslims. We kept it because that shows the importance it, uh, and the role that it played for the Muslims. And this also goes against the narrative that, you know, uh, the Arabs essentially in the Hejaz were, quote unquote, racist, quote unquote, anti-black, quote unquote, uh, um, uh, hated black, anti-blackness. Yes, there were a period of time that that happened, but this was not an inherent thing. And it was a society that was placed based on class system. And so that shows you that the rule of Najash, his people, the, the power uh, they had, the kingdom, their trade, all of these things were things that were valued uh, 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 before the Prophet Sallallahu comes to the scene, during the mis um, um, uh, sort of the, the, the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu as well as after. And we will sort of have to understand that. And that's why his name is preserved in the Islamic uh, tradition more than anything else. Uh, uh, and in terms of uh, uh, sort of uh, the um, king's, uh, uh, what is it called? There is a term for when the kings uh, write down their own history and their achievements, and then it goes into, um, uh, uh, I don't know. But anyway. So it's been said that he minted his own uh, um, uh, material in terms of gold and, 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 and silver uh, the, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a coins. And that shows his uh, emperor's effigy in that way. And so many, many scholars have argued whether that was him or not. Some uh, king uh, uh, lists give uh, two emperors that are somewhat named Ila Gabas, okay? And so some uh, earlier uh, kind of date that um, uh, historical narrative of, of, of Ashama as that individual, and some others date the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? So those that documented Al Najashi uh, somewhat disagreed about his name, they said, okay? Likewise, they disagreed about the name of his father. Is that Abjar with a, a, a jim? or is a with a ha, looking at from the uh, uh, Arabic uh, literature. So when we look at from the Islamic uh, uh, Arabic uh, written literature, do, they, do we look at, you know, from the, the Semitic language that we have the, from the ha or the jim? And the thing is, it's really funny because the Giz language, the Aksumite uh, official Franca lingua should have been the Semitic language that we know. So it can be, uh, um, uh, seen as uh, as a jim or ha, so it has been said um, uh, uh, that uh, in terms of history that he succeeded uh, from his uncle while he was very young. Now we're going to go into a bit of his history, 
it's been said at a young age he was sold uh, to slavery uh, which was as part of a coup attempt and this coup attempt uh, came to um, came to be due to um, because uh, you know his father had only one son which is ashama right and so when his father only had him and he's the current uh, king or the current nachaj some of the um, uh, um, the official court um, uh, uh, um, uh, court entourage, uh, whether that would be the generals, whether that would be the, the the clergy, and you have to remember the clergy are really in essence the power behind the power. So they're the power behind the throne in essence. So the clergy are the first uh, um, uh, point of uh, sort of call of uh, sort of point of uh, uh, sort of reference or that you go to when you want to talk about how uh, Aksum is ruled, when you want to talk about how a king follows another king, whether this uh, king is religious enough, whether this uh, Najash is someone who they can accept. So all of that happens through the clergy and the generals as well. And the generals, in essence, were nothing else but people who went along with the clergy. And you have to also understand as a contemporary, much of the senior positions were held by people who were very well versed with Christianity. So if you were a general, if you were a, a, a sort of a duke, if you were a, a, a bishop, if you were a, a, a landowner, if you were an advisor to the king, you were well versed with Christianity. You had to have a, you have to have a formal education about Christianity. So that the people um, uh, in terms of uh, this hierarchy system were people really well versed in Christianity. And so they did not tolerate anybody that went against the grain in terms of what they knew as how to uh, uh, rule. And these are some of the things that historians have talked about again and again and again, okay? And so the coup came about because his father had only him, whereas his uncle, the father's uh, 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 brother, uh, had 12 sons. So he had a, he had a mashallah, a uh, good line ahead of him in terms of in, uh, uh, heritage, you know, in terms of people who can succeed him, right? And so they said, you know what, we're not really comfortable that if this Najash dies, that we would pass the throne to his son, i.e. Ashama. So we need to do something about this Najash being dethroned, because if he dies now, Automatic, they really the rule should go to his son. So we should make a, a conflict between two brothers and make say and and say sort of go against one another, and you kind of sort of have to uh, coop or or so, do some sort of an uh, um, a rebellion. And so the brother kind of rebelled against his brother the Najash, and he uh, happened to kill him. And so when he killed the brother, became inheritance in essence, sort of the brother inherited the throne, and so the uncle became now. The Najash, and therefore automatically the son's rule were replaced with the uncle's rule. Okay, so Aisha radiallahu anha uh, has uh, is said to have uh, uh, transmitted uh, some of the stories that come about this narrative, right? So Aisha is said to have transmitted that the Najashi uh, uncle was the one that has uh, uh, replaced his father through coup. And uh, the reasoning was, was that obviously his brother had 12 sons and the bloodline would have continued. And therefore, Ashama were taken from uh, um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, they grabbed the rule from him. And sort of Ashama then uh, thereafter grew under the tutelage uh, and the love of his uncle. Sort of the uncle kind of developed a passion and love for him that he actually brought closer uh, sort of close to him uh, rather than his sons. And so his sons were not much of involved with the throne. And this is also one of the other things that uh, Aksumite Empire and emperors did a lot of the times. If the rule and the house that ruled or the kingdom or the throne or, or, or the, the capital were in, 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 in one area, the people who would inherit uh, uh, down the line were always made sure that were, they were far away from that rule, that they were far away, because the intrigue of the court was such that it created a lot of conflict, it created a lot of passionate argument, and so the clergy did not want that, and this was a very smart move on their behalf, that they moved a lot of the, uh, what is it called, they moved a lot of the, and this is a narrative that you could see 
from uh, 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 Amharic rule uh, again and again, Christian Amharic rule again and again, that even when the Solomonic Empire comes down the line, this is something you see that, you know, the, the Najash or the king uh, uh, at the head of the, the rule would constantly make sure that the people that would inherit him, the people that would succeed him, were kind of a bit removed from him. And so they were removed, the 12 sons were removed. But the person who were not part of that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sort of succession was the son, Ashama. So he grew up with the tutelage of his uncle and because uh, they did not fear that there was going to be a problem. But obviously the clergy, the generals, they had another uh, mokaf, they had another plan to say, mm, you know, this guy, is going to find out one of these days and he's going to attack us and he's going to do ABC. So we need to kind of remove him from the scene. We need to make sure. So it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that, you know, he uh, was there. It wasn't an, an enough that he was, uh, that they killed his father. It wasn't enough that they forsook, uh, sorry, sorry, um, that they uh, uh, made, uh, that ma they made him, uh, 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 that they took his rule from him and inheritance, his rightful position, but that they actually now want him out of the uh, equation at all. They don't want around him. And also you have to remember that some of the traits that has been said about him was that he was a decky, someone who's smart, someone who had a uh, good uh, head on his shoulders and, and sort of had an amazing understanding. And so they said, uh, you know, they said to the to the uncle, you know, we want you to kill him. You know, we need you to kill him because this guy is getting too influential. And so, subhanallah, uh, this is the uncle couldn't bear himself because this has happened. This is the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you kind of develop a link with someone and you have that passion and love for them and you raise them slightly, you cannot but have a, a, a good... Uh, um, uh, uh, a good wish for them that you want to take care of them and this is a similar story with the the pharaoh of uh, musa alayhi salam that sort of raised within his household and he couldn't you know he couldn't bring himself to do something bad to that boy and we have to also understand historically the pharaoh that uh, um, raised uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, prophet musa alayhi salam and the pharaoh that went against him were two uh, different uh, um, uh, pharaohs okay and so uh, this in essence uh, he says then so this najash and the uncle says we that, that you know qataltum uh, abah that you've killed his uh, his father bil ams yesterday yesterday yester years right you killed him okay and then now you want me that I kill him? You know, that you want me today to, that I kill him? But he said, Bal akhruju, uh, min baladikum. Ak bal akhruju min baladikum. So that, uh, actually, I have a better idea that if you cannot uh, stand him, just give him and make him leave and put him in, on, in an exile. You know, make him leave from your country. So this is what they did, and they sold uh, um, uh, they sold him into a slavery. They did not properly exile him. It's been said uh, through our uh, uh, historic um, uh, traditions that he's been sold uh, 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 to a, 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 a one of the uh, Abi, uh, Abi, Abi Damir or Damir, uh, Tomra uh, tribes of, of Yemen, right? So they, they sold to one of these um, uh, tribal members who uh, basically came to trade in, in, in Aksum. So they sold him and they said, you know what? Ma'asalama, you can take him. He's your slave. And they sold him as a slave. But subhanAllah, uh, Allah had different plans, right? So after being sold for, uh, this, you know, as, as record said, Bisitimi'a dirham, or sub amia that you know for 600 to 700 dirhams that he's been sold yeah and while while the boy was on on on, on sort of a ship sailing away the uncle on uh, the uncle on that um same day same evening actually died okay he died i think it was it's been said that he was killed by uh, one of the storms that were brewing at the time and so and what they did and realized the the uh, uh the um, sort of Christian um, uh, clergy and the generals and the royal court is now that we need to 
plan for succession and need, need to call in now the 12 sons and see who is the most viable for them because it, it, it wasn't an automatic thing. It's not always that, you know, the eldest inherited. That is the norm and the nature of, of inheritance. But um, uh, the succession was always seen through the uh, royal court as someone who is the most able to succeed. And so when they looked at these two 12 uh, sons that he had, <laughs> they came to regret and they said, oh my God, these sons are not viable for the throne. They are not viable. This, uh, they are not viable for succession. Now, I don't know what Muhammad here literally would mean. Is it the Ahmaq, the one who is dumb, the one who is um, uh, doesn't have smart uh, um, smartness, does, the one that's not um, uh, shrewd? Is it? Is it are they talking about from a leader's perspective or are they talking about physical uh, or a mental disability or are they talking about maybe some people who were um, uh, not able or not capable of taking ru uh, rulership? I don't know exactly what the, that means, but one or the other, they decided this was not viable. So they brought back the boy that they sold to slavery and proclaimed him king or they proclaimed him uh, Najash, right? And so there is an incident that even when they brought him back, the guy who they bought, uh, sold it to, they wouldn't give his money. And he, they, he didn't, they didn't give him his money. They sort of told him, get out of here. We're not going to pay you back what we owe you. And sort of that created a problem, uh, which down the line he um, uh, uh, basically talked about, right? Uh, so it's, it, um, it's said, <clears throat> talking about uh, in, 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 in one of the magasis, that uh, um, uh, it's been said, and, and I have this slide in the middle, which I shouldn't have actually. I was hoping to have this slide down the line, but we'll just go through it. Uh, that it's, you know, it's been said that um, the Quraysh, when they were fighting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in uh, one of the battles of, of Badr, uh, they um, hired one of these able men, uh, soldiers of fortune, to actually, um, fight on their behalf. So it's not like only one companion or sorry, not one individual, two, but they, a whole regiment, right? So they hired a whole regiment of soldiers. And this is seen through the poetries that um, one of uh, 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 um, historians uh, uh, puts in Al-Waqidi. He, he puts this and he says the Northeast Africans or the Habash went of throwing their lances everywhere. And they were there in, in numbers, basically. And so Abu Farij, uh, 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 in his work in Kitab al-Aghani, he talks about it and he, he mentions that how some of these people were mentioned that, you know, they use these people from Ard al-Habasha to constantly um, uh, make their lines, uh, their, uh, make their uh, army much more than they would normally be. So now <clears throat> we're going to go to the episode of now the, the Najash is ruling for a while. He is uh, Adil. He does not want to repeat a cycle of what has happened to him in the past in terms of a son, in terms of a, a, a nephew, in terms of a, a, a leader and a judge. So he did not like and he did not accept this oppression cycle. He did not ac accept this uh, type of behavior where he was uh, um, always seen as, um, uh, uh, you know, sorry, he became famous for his Adil, right? So. That's why the Prophet وسلم, you know, when he down the line says there is an, a, a judge that is an Adil, go to him. This is something that's not only uh, known throughout the Arabian Peninsula or the Hejaz, but it's something that was known throughout uh, uh, Persia. It was known throughout the Byzantine Kingdom. It was known, it was known throughout the lands that he did not uh, approve of oppression and, and going against people. So the arrival uh, um, of, 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 of the um, uh, Muslims in what was Rajab, the eighth year before Hijra, eighth year before Hijra, which is the uh, uh, Gregorian calendar around about 614. Uh, in the year of 614, companions of the Prophet Sallallahu secretly left uh, 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 Mecca for the port of um, uh, Shu'aiba, which is uh, near Jeddah, okay? And they boarded a, a boat and, and they headed themselves towards Aksum. And so Aksum is somewhat located modern day uh, Eritrea and not, is in, not in Ethiopia. So that's 
wrong, where it says modern day Ethiopia. So Aksum at the time, the capital would have been what is modern day uh, near Masawa, okay? So, uh, it, which is uh, found in Eritrea. So they would have um, landed there and a lot of uh, scholars talked about, you know, where did they land? Uh, how did they land? Where did they prosper? Where did they live? What did they do? The companions in that sense. There's been a lot of very dif difference of uh, uh, opinions, but the most viable essentially is where they landed and the seat of Aksum uh, Empire and the Aksum uh, Emperor and the capital was modern day Masawa, near modern day Masawa, which is uh, um, uh, uh, seen in modern day Eritrea, okay? And so that's where they, where they would have probably lived near uh, the Najash, okay? So the Najash welcomed them uh, but obviously, as we know, through the uh, seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Quraysh followed suit, they came after them. And so when Quraysh came after them uh, and sent uh, Abdullah ibn Abi uh, Rabi'ah, as well as Amr ibn Abdul As, uh, they tried to bribe and, you know, say, you know what, essentially their argument was, because, you know, the lawyers that they were, <laughs> their, their argument essentially was like, listen, uh, uh, king, these people are criminals, they've committed crimes, and they run away from justice. Simple as that. Just give us back to them, you know. And you are known for your, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, you are famed for your just, your adala. So we want you to pass them on. That was their initial argument, right? And so, and they somewhat also brought some bribery as well. So a lot of the material that people traded in up and down, that people would have normally transversed um, uh, the Red Sea and to buy, they brought it, uh, loads of that as gifts. You know, these finally worked out um, uh, 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 leather uh, and leather works because at the time there was, there was not much of a, a leather work in, in modern day Eritrea, modern day Ethiopia, North Ethiopia, right? And so this is, has happened and in essence, so when that happened, what does the Najash say? And this is a really important thing to understand. To say like, okay, you know, they come to him and they say, we want these criminals. You know, we want you to extradite them. That's what the word for it today is. You want you to extradite them, we were willing to take them. But that is not something that Najash took immediately on board. And so he said, no, I'm not gonna, without hitting anybody, I'm not gonna do that. And so they said, okay, you're gonna hear them out. Okay, now before you hear them out then, take this uh, to consideration. They consider your religion a joke. They consider Christianity a joke. And they say things about uh, Mary, they say, or, or Maryam alayha salam. They consider her things that are uh, of, 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 of a bad nature, you know? And so that is when the sort of bribery did not automatically work. Uh, they made a focal point that their creed was attacked. So they said uh, a, a creed, uh, the point of contention became the creed and uh, Jafar ibn Abi Talib uh, sort of uh, defended the creed by reciting Surah Maryam. And subhanAllah, as soon as he recited Surah Maryam, uh, and Najash recognized the beautiful message in there, the pristine message, the thing that he studied his youth and young, age and the belief that he had that this is what uh, uh, my religion says this is what christianity is about right the tawhidi the uh, church obviously some people might have digressed it some people might have come with a lot of uh, bid'ah some people might have introduced things that are not part of it but this the core message is exactly that that's what we know and so then amr went back uh, as that uh, issue uh, was put to rest and was put to bed uh, about uh, when Surah Maryam was recited. Then Amr uh, went back to Al Najash after having uh, sort of discussed with his uh, colleagues. He said, Ya Najashi, another point. You know, this persons or these people that you have in your court and you're protecting, right? Okay, they say some other complete things about Jesus and that Jesus was human being and he was not the Lord incarnate, right? He was not uh, 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 as, as you believe or as Christianity believes in, 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 in large sum. So this is what they say about him. They do not have good opinion about Jesus. And so therefore, once more, um, uh, the, the Jafar was uh, uh, called in and, and called uh, and to stand and sort of um, 
uh, explain himself. And this is um, uh, uh, some, some of the stuff that he said. And he said, and he recited again, uh, one of the uh, uh, verses of the Quran, he say, we say about him that which of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, brought and taught us and said, saying that uh, Jesus is the servant of God and his apostle and his spirit and his word, which he cast into Mary, the blessed virgin. And so I'm going to quickly move on because we uh, well uh, know this episode uh, extensively. So and then Najashi picked up a piece of a stick and w- relating to passionately about this story. And he replied passionately by God, Jesus, son of Mary, does not exceed, exceed what you have said by the length of this stick. Right. This is exactly what you said. And remember, we talked about earlier on pre uh, Najash era that we talked about how the church, uh, the Aksumai church became distinctive and sort of cut off with the um, uh, along line with the Coptic uh, church. They have both cut off from the uh, Roman church because of this concept of not agreeing about the the nature of Jesus uh, or the nature of Isa alayhi salam. And so a lot of these people had this inclination and believed that uh, uh, he was a, a man and with uh, um, obviously a, mir- a miraculous uh, element. So like we believe in miraculous birth, miraculous uh, deeds and everything else. So they believed in that with obviously added elements that was not necessarily in line with what Islam says, but this is what Islam came and updated. And so this is what the Najas kind of relate to, right? So his court attendees around him snorted when he said this, and this is sort of an idea that uh, gave the, the principal understanding, oh, you know what? Uh, you're not following the, the you're not following the, uh, you're going against the grain. You're not following the da'wah as, as you should have followed. And so um, uh, this is why Najas then said to the people, the Sahaba, go indeed, you are safe in my lands, leave. And, and, and so the, he says here, idhabu fa'antum shayyum. Shayyum here, fa'antum shayyum Shayyum here has been said, uh, by various scholars means in uh, in Giz, it, and it is a Giz word, it's a um, uh, sort of a Semitic uh, early Amharic uh, part of the language, which means um, high official. So you kind of high official, you have a status and maqam with me as Najash that you represent not only the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but you can actually represent ideals and morals that are of high nature. So go, uh, you, I give you like an, uh, a, an astute uh, level of understanding, and 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 this is why he said that famous saying, uh, where he then said that famous saying, which he really became uh, famous for, and 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 the historians recorded, right? And he says, and he says again, retorting to to his generals and and and. Christian uh, 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 priest, everything he says, Ma Allahu minni rishwa, that God did not take bribery from me, or did God uh, took no bribe from me when He gave me back my kingdom. I.e., in the past when I took that kingdom that people connived and and sort of planned when they took when when. When they took that kingdom from me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it back to me, he did not uh, took bribery from me, okay? Okay, to get that kingdom back. And that I should take bribery for it. So I'm not going to take bribery for it today. And God did not want man what, what, what man wanted against me. So why should I do what they want against me? You understand? So I will not um, obey people against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that essence. And this is an amazing, beautiful ethos that even translates to our uh, 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 creed and aqeedah and tawheed that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when he says uh, that we should uh, obey the messenger, we should obey Allah and the messenger and those people of Ulul Amr, there is a clause there that, you know, those people of Ulul Amr, are obeyed to the point that they are not worthy of obeying. And so that's why um, uh, uh, that, you know, where he says uh, um, uh, that I will not obey against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, against uh, sort of, uh, and, and, and side with people and bribe it. So go away, go live in my land, wherever you wish to live, do whatever you wish and prosper as much as you wish. 
And this is an amazing uh, narrative that shows, again, the character of and the history of Al Najash in that sense. So it's still in the same year, uh, around about, but then few year, few months later, uh, depending on how you look at, right? Uh, the Muslims in uh, Ard al-Habasha and the Muslims in Aksum at the time heard that there was some sort of a peace in Mecca or that the Meccans have accepted Islam, right? And then Meccans accepted Islam. So they kind of rushed and returned uh, to went to, back to Mecca and then they founded Mecca uh, hostile. They, they, they sort of came in the dark of the night and they chose not to enter Mecca. Some of them said, okay, we'll just sit in this encampment outside of Mecca. Some of us should go out and investigate uh, in, 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 sort of uh, in the dark of the night and sort of look into really has it changed and sort of do uh, do that and then come back to us. And then they realized, subhanAllah, Mecca has not changed, has not been uh, embraced Islam. It actually increased its oppression and, and, and severity of punishment against the Prophet Sallallahu and his, his companions. And therefore, they decided that a host of people came back with uh, that uh, group. We have to remember that group that went to, um, uh, to go for the first hijrah, to go to the Najash, they limited were like 13 or 14 people. So there were not many people. So by this time, so when they go into Mecca and now go back to uh, uh, Aksum again, or Ard al-Habasha, they returned with a larger number, and it's been said over 100 or close to 100, but over 100 men and women and children have left now Ard al-Habasha and have gone back to um, uh, uh, gone back to uh, Ard al-Habasha. This is in essence known as the second year of the Hijra. Sorry, the, sorry. This is known as the second Hijra, and so the third Hijra would be the the, the one that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he will go for from Mecca to Medina uh, with uh, with him and Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, anhu. So that is why uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam go for the third Hijra to Medina, which was the first of uh, Rabi' al awwal on 40, uh, the 14th year of prophethood of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that um, and then in around about 628, which is the sixth year of the Hijra, after the battle of uh, uh, Hudaybiyah, al-Najashi accepted Islam, right? So al-Najashi accepted that Islam. The question is then people ask why so late you know, because he had uh, all these people. He might have been uh, Muslim, Allahu Alam. There is no indication that he has not been a Muslim and has not accepted. He might have lived between uh, accepting the premise and the general ethos and the general uh, uh, moral messages of uh, the prophetic mission, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but has not probably publicly announced that he was a Muslim. So they say that in, in that year, the sixth, sixth year of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi after Hudaybiyah, Al-Najashi accepted Islam through a letter that was sent to him by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was carried by Umru. And he also asked him at that instant to send back the Muslims, right? And so this is the time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in Medina. And, and obviously this is the sixth year of Hijra, the, the companions and the Prophet Sallallahu kind of established themselves and they have uh, they had been having a, a, a wonderful life. But uh, the thing is, there is an incident that has happened between that time when the Prophet Sallallahu is asking the companions to return and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the period of the second Hijra, which I will uh, go into because I haven't put in the notes, unfortunately. Uh, the, the incident that happened is some of the companions have narrated and told us that the, um, as soon as the, um, as soon as the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu either sent him the letter to accept Islam, because different narrations say different things, right? either sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the uh, official letter and he accepted Islam and Najas, or slightly prior to that, as soon as you know, he allowed them to live under his uh, protection and gave them a land uh, to live and, 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 and uh, cater over and trade over, there is some sort of a civil war happened, which was uh, orchestrated by his generals and clergy, right? 
because they wanted him now out of the frame because obviously they kind of suspect him to be either Muslim or he was at the time outright Muslim. Allahu alam. So we can say that he probably, uh, they suspected him to be a Muslim or lenient towards Islam. And so they kind of cooped and they went against him. And that's when he, sallallahu, that's when uh, he, uh, al-Najashi, radiallahu um, anhu, uh, goes out and fights against those people who came out to do battle. And then basically he actually talks to them and he conveys them and to say, do you not trust me? Do you not, did you forget my adal? Did you forget my justice? Do you not think I'm a just uh, right person? You know, would you think I go against the truth and everything else? Would you, what, what gives you uh, a, a sort of an, um, uh, how, what's the word? What gives you um, the idea or what allows you to give you the idea that I would be oppressive and do anything contrary to what I've been doing so far. And so the people believed in him, the people accepted him. And so he kind of went back. And so when he went back, that is years later, that's one narrative years later that he accepts Islam officially. Another narrative is he accepts Islam and then certain uh, incidents take place where uh, the Sahaba tell us about this incident of the coup or the people uh, rebelling against him, right? But uh, subhanAllah, fortunately, uh, uh, so the, the, some of the Sahaba, due to the conflict that was happening in the capital, they ended up moving out of the capital. And so they say, uh, we were not feeling secure. We felt so sad. And some of them said, we've never sa felt sad as much as sadness that we felt at that period. Nothing greater, no great, uh, greater sadness that we felt. So some compared even the, the oppression and the system systemic um, uh, a punishment that they faced in, in, in Mecca was actually less to the fear and the hizm that they had when it comes to the, um, the, the, the things that was happening with uh, the king or Al-Najash because of the people rebelling against them. So kind of they kind of ran away from uh, where the capital was, modern day Eritrea and that sort of thing. So they had to move. And so the historians say they have moved even further south. And so it's been said that even for the south that they moved and, and it's been uh, sort of hypothesized, it was probably Zayla or near the um, uh, areas to Zayla, modern day Zayla, but not exactly Zayla today, where it's modern day Somalia, but even in that vicinity in that area. Okay. Now that is a, 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 a one version of, of, of the story and how it happened and how they moved. And it's also said that obviously Najashi moved the capital after that incident to 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 closer to southern uh, modern day southern Ethiopia. Okay, so after uh, thirteen to fourteen years, the companions returned home, and uh, after staying thirteen fourteen years in Ard al Habasha or mo modern day uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and that sort of um, uh, uh, Djibouti, that sort of uh, uh, landmass, they returned and they came home and they settled in what is uh, Medina. And the prophet with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and so therefore in the year, uh, the ninth year of the hijra, around about 630, 31, in the month of Rajab, after three years of being publicly Muslim, because remember we talked about was he Muslim publicly or was he uh, um, Muslim uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, secretly? We don't know. Allah Allah. So in the month of Rajab, after three years of uh, being Muslim. Uh, Al-Najashi uh, died, and this is roughly, it's been said, a year, a year and a half the, uh, uh, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's death, and before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they were very close proximity in terms of the timelines that they have passed away, right? And so some, some contemporary writers, some historians and, and, and thinkers and stuff, write and question if Najashi, who welcomed the Muslims to Ard al-Habasha, was one and the, the same who embraced Islam uh, 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 decades later, or almost a decade later. So there is a, a, a discussion that has been written and, 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 and that had been going on for some time. And I uh, recommend people to look into, uh, um, uh, look into uh, um, sorry, Islam al-Najashi wal-i'tamad uh, ala masadir al-Islamiyya uh, by uh, uh, Mahmoud. If you look at Dr. and Sheikh Mahmoud, uh, Sheikh, um, 
uh, Khattab, if you look at the, his work and you will basically get to uh, understand, maybe it's a, it's a work worth um, uh, translating and, uh, and, and looking into in the Lahkarim. But in any case, this is uh, uh, some of the arguments that has happened. And uh, also the, it's not, um, uh, it's not, how do you say, it's not a, a strange thing that his historical achievements, his history is not completely recorded like other uh, Najashis and other uh, Negises and other, um, uh, what is it called, other are are the kings uh, of, of, of a similar time period or before. The, the way they've been recorded, his is not being recorded because this is something that used to happen frequently, specifically when we talk about the clergy uh, trying to record the history of uh, 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 modern day, uh, uh, modern day, um, uh, what is it called, um, um, sort of um, modern day, uh, uh, sorry, a contemporary day, a contemporary material about history in terms of um, uh, the tarikh and achievements of, of the kings, right? And so uh, that's why uh, Tamrat says in his beautiful book, which is called um, Church and State, uh, and where he assesses and talks about from the 13th century onwards, the, the church and the state of uh, uh, Ethiopia, right? He says in the, in the royal chronicles and other traditions for the period, uh, one can detest a deliberate attempt to suppress the violent end of an Ethiopian kings in the lands of their enemies. Now in the period that he's referring to is the period that he's focusing on his writing of about 13th century, but of 14th century in essence, but this also applies throughout history because these are the sort of type of things that would happen with kings that were not favorable. They were kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, chosen to um, clean uh, from history or purge from history, right? So uh, Imam Dahabi, uh, rahmatullah Ali, says about him, he was one of those uh, whose Islam was good. That he is a tabi'i from one perspective. Okay, and from another perspective, Sahib, that you know, obviously, uh, considering a contemporary Sahib, not as a companion on a legal uh, uh, um, uh, context, right? Okay, and so he says, um, uh, from most of it, and he passed away while the Prophet وسلم, was still alive. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, led his funeral prayers over his absent body, which, according to the most relied upon view, he and Najashi was singled out for. And this is true because um, uh, according to some of the um, uh, records that we have, there is no record that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi prayed over uh, someone else, uh, Janaz al ghaib And so this is why uh, some of the things he was singled out for. Some actually say some narrations, I don't know their, um, their siha and everything else and, and their authenticity, I've not looked into it, say that even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi went to uh, Baqir to stand there and sort of to sort of uh, people there to so give that imagery that he passed away we're gonna pray Janas over him but most of the uh, and, and narrations actually specifically talk about while during in the Salah prayers while in, in, in a masjid and stuff that he was uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided uh, spontaneously to pray Janazah over him and, 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 and he told his companions that this was because our, your brother who passed away in Ard al Habasha, the Najashi passed away, right? And so those companions that migrated to Abyssinia had already returned to Medina during the Khaybar campaign. And so by that already, the, the, the Khaybar campaign has uh, finished. And, uh, and, and so these companions have arrived. But his level and his maqam in terms of a legal uh, 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 structure, in terms of the, the, the kutub and how we narrate a hadith and how we uh, class him in the tabaqa that he belongs to, he is class, although he has no narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu However, his level of tabaqa will be classed as a, uh, a senior uh, to a tabi'i, but below a sahabi, okay? And, and that is really important to understand. There's a very few people who meet that uh, criteria because they were contemporaries of the Prophet Sallallahu but because they did not see the Prophet Sallallahu which is the man laqa ma'an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is the one that is classed technically as a Sahabi, someone who spent the time with the Prophet and seen him is classed as a Sahabi 
not someone who uh, just lived in the same time. So when someone who's seen the Prophet Sallallahu and believed in him, that is the full uh, um, uh, embrace of it. So uh, moving on, uh, and, and it's been transmitted and it's been said that from uh, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha that she said that the grave of Al-Najashi, it's been said that a light was seen constantly over his, his grave and sort of when he died and he got buried, uh, that is some of uh, um, uh, one of the di dilemmas that we had is that his uh, burial site was not completely also known. So you can see from history that he slowly purchased out of history, his achievements, who he was, his name, um, where he died, when he died, where he's buried. A lot of that lives in sort of um, uh, infamy as it were, and, and only lives, in, 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 uh, lives famously within the Muslim tradition. But when it comes to the other, other tradition, when it comes to Western tradition, when it comes to uh, the uh, the um, uh, what is this um, uh, the records that the clergy also stuff there is very little that his uh, um, uh, achievements are celebrated and recorded. He was laid, later buried. Uh, it's been said uh, about uh, ten miles north of Bukhara. And the reason it's been said is first they placed them the, the royal burial sites, and then they kind of moved them away from it because there are royal, royal, royal burial sites. So they kind of took him out of it and then they moved him to modern day uh, Bukhara, uh, which is modern day Tikray land. Uh, and, 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 and so this is also uh, historically attested to Imam Ahmed, uh, Imam Ahmed uh, Al Ghazi, Imam Ahmed Gurey, Imam Ahmed. Um, Gran, as they as these known as uh, other places, that he traveled to uh, in, during his conquest and spreading of Islam in what is modern day Ethiopia uh, or South Ethiopia or North Ethiopia. He uh, came through that um, uh, landmass, and he, because obviously the people and everybody knew at the time where he was buried, he decided to uh, visit because he, he was on his route, he was on his, so he kind of visited and he prayed. Uh, over him and 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 sort of uh, uh, visited him. So there is a strong uh, indicative uh, and indicative uh, of a general southward movement of the center of gravity of the Christian kingdom already in the seventh century. That's what Tamrat says, and he's talking about here uh, a point that we're trying to sort of emphasize that obviously since he died. And uh, since after his rule kind of moved uh, and the rule of those people who followed kind of moved towards South uh, 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 Central uh, Ethiopia and not necessarily Northern Eritrea, what is modern day Eritrea and that sort of thing. And this is when uh, the Exomite rule kind of um, uh, um, uh, becomes uh, uh, dwindling. He, le he left uh, a son that, um, we, we hear about uh, a lot of the times in terms of uh, the hadiths and, and, and the seerah. And his son also has been said to have embraced Islam and spent time with uh, the companions and, and, and as well as the, the Prophet wasallam. And so, um, yeah, there is a lot, a lot of information out there about, uh, um, about uh, his son. But we're not going to stand still on it because we're really, subhanAllah, it's nine o'clock. Um, brothers, are you there? <laughs> yes, Sheikh, we're still here. Um, I, 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 unfortunately, um, I do this a lot. I, I run over time a lot. Um, no, not at all. We started late, that's why. Oh, so yeah, we, we okay. were aiming to finish for nine, alhamdulillah. Okay, so I'll, yeah. I'll conclude in, t in terms of uh, yes. what has been said about him in terms of the Quran. We, so we know it's not about Najash, but it's rather about Abraha and what he did in terms of uh, Himyar and southern Yemen. But it's also a very important lesson that the Prophet Sallallahu when he was in Mecca at the time, subhanAllah, and he was preaching Islam and these Meccans were being very arrogant and he was, they were oppressing him. That's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed uh, the Surah of Surah Tulfil to say to the Meccans, to Quraysh, you know, decades ago do you remember decades ago just decades ago you were guys frantically dispersing and and moving to uh, the hills and mountains into mecca and forsaking this house that you are fighting over now that you are uh, claiming to have ownership right you were leaving and the only force that protected you 
from the force, the great force that was coming to you, was my miracle intervention. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Alam tara kayf. Do you not see how? Do you not ponder how? Do you not see? Do you not reflect how? Fa'al rabbuka, that your Rabb, that your Lord has done to or done uh, with or done away with Ashab al-Fil, those people of the elephant, you know, those trampling huge large elephant that you've probably never seen and were not able to um, uh, maintain because that is true because they swept through the entirety of north uh, Yemen as well as the Hejaz very quickly uh, up to Ta'if. Ta'if actually immediately when they came to Ta'if, Ta'if uh, pledged allegiance and uh, the, 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 the head of the Ta'if uh, clans kind of swore allegiance towards um, uh, the, uh, the Ab- Abraha, and they kind of, kind of, uh, sort of accepted him, and they said, "We're going to accept you as a rule." So this is that verse of the Quran that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was talking about, right? And it's also this is also some of the things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala talks about when in the Quran, and some of the uh, companions, some of the tabi'in and companions have expressed that when the Rasul, sorry, when 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 the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi was revealed uh, the Surah. What, the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says some, some of the people of the book believe in God in what they have been sent down to you, in what was sent down to them, humbling themselves, you know? Khashi'ina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, khashi'ina, okay? And so therefore they're humbling themselves and they recognize the truth in there, okay? And so they humble themselves, humbling themselves before God. They would never sell God revelation for a small price. These people will have their rewards with their Lord. God is swift in reckoning. And this is really important uh, verse of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in, in an incident where some uh, Salaf Nusul said they, this relate to some of the companions of uh, Najashi and priests that came to that came to uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who cried and, 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 and sort of uh, made themselves uh, um, uh, uh, very uh, emotional, well, very emotional, right? And another said, okay, this is related to the Najash himself, right? And so al baghawi according to Ibn Abbas, he says, and Jabir and Anas and Qatata, these are one of the most four leading uh, mufassirin uh, of the Sahaba as well as uh, the, the, the Tabi'in, uh, says, um, uh, this verse نزلت في في النجاشي ملك الحبشة that this verse has been revealed about the Najash uh, which who, who was the king of uh, Ard al-Habasha okay and several other verses which I will absolutely skip over now because <laughs> we are really running late uh, so I'm gonna um, uh, post talk about post Najashi now quickly in in, in very uh, quick circulation so what do we have in terms of uh, uh, post uh, Najashi he comes to the scene he um, allows people to be uh, 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 refugees in his land he allows them to uh, spread da'wah and give Islam a lot of people say and talk about historians no these people were like guests they lived under this clergy and this clergy were very oppressive they were very um uh, not accepting to various uh, di- uh sort of uh, views that was contrary to um uh what is it called uh, anti-christian views or anti uh, uh, sort of views that go against christianity right so they were not able to spread islam some say that but obviously that's true to an extent because we do not see many people converting to Islam. However, we do see a lot of people in the vicinities of um, uh, where the, uh, the the companions lived, where later on Al-Najashi would move to, has been accepting Islam on a consistent basis. And that's why you see even the Sahaba when they go back and they talk about uh, what they left behind and the people that they left behind. They talk about hosts of people that were um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, from Ard al-Habasha that, that they left behind. And so these people obviously leave their um, mark on the society and therefore Islam becomes entrenched. Islam's Islamic values become entrenched. And that's why the Northern um, uh, sort of uh, hemisphere in Northeast Africa, where the coastal lines are, is where Islam immediately gains a foot and where da'wah spreads, right? And so this is why a lot of 
uh, scholars down the line, uh, some of these names that I just uh, mentioned here, uh, talk about and write about consistently about Northeast Africa, about Ard al Habasha, about um, uh, the Eastern Africa proper. So the reason that they do that is because they always want to go back to that history and that achievement. And this is also, it's been said that as part of uh, the Najashi's inheritance, sorry, Najashi's heritage, is that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi uh, Wasallam discouraged, as well as many other companions after, afterwards later, to bring jihad to certain people of, of that part of the world, right? So uh, they, they, they accepted Islam and therefore the that Islam basically came to them in this beautiful way and they spread Islam in this beautiful way but they, they the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in, 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 in uh, several hadiths uh, not to um, uh, uh, go to uh, uh, Northeast Africa for, for the perspective of, of actually spreading Islam uh, and, 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 and sort of uh, going and competing against the rule that is there, right? But also uh, the, uh, many, many of the companions, the Khulafa al Rashidin, none of them are on record to have sent detachment or forces to Northeast Africa or East Africa. The only few times that detachment and forces has been sent to there was on the heels of a, 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 a group of hosts of people who were fleeing from their rule. So they were fearing that these people will go abroad recruit, support, and come back and go against them. But in essence, they never ever go into Northeast Africa in that sense and landing it there. Unlike what happened with Amr ibn As in terms of uh, uh, Egypt when they came and landed in Egypt and conquered uh, uh, much of the Coptic uh, uh, and as well as the Maghrib uh, uh, part of the world. So this has not been uh, the, 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 the same uh, um, uh, how do you say the same working, uh, um, uh, the same uh, basically uh, the same mandate? They did not have the similar mandate, and so and uh, these many dis uh, many uh, dynasties formed, many rulers formed, and and some of the dynasties that we should get my get ourselves familiarized with. And like the brother said earlier on, when you said you didn't know that there were <laughs> there were so many uh, sultanates and 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 and. Uh, uh, people who ruled and dynasties that ruled uh, there, just are these are some of them. These are dynasties of the Horn. Uh, so this means in Ethiopia proper that we know today, these are some of the sultanates that have been there. Okay. Then you have um, the dynasties uh, that were in Eritrea, modern day Eritrea. Then you have the dynasties that um, were within uh, Djibouti. Then you have the dynasties that were within uh, Tanzania and, 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 and sort of uh, uh, further south, uh, sort of Southeast Africa, right? And then uh, you have the dynasties, for example, uh, uh, Horn of Africa, which is uh, at the moment, um, sorry, Kenya specifically. Uh, you have the dynasties that were uh, Somali Peninsula. So like you have these dynasties. So you just seen hosts of uh, dynasties and, and, and sultanates that ruled, the Muslim sultanates that ruled uh, for the past uh, 13, 1200 years, uh, saying basically 1200 years something on record to have ruled uh, various parts of the Eastern African uh, Peninsula. So that is really important to understand. And they have uh, been setting up uh, what is called uh, Riwaq and, and Riwaqs are in essence, uh, colleges and, and places where people learn when they go to institutes such as the, you know, big masajids, such as the harams, such as the Mecca, Medina, you know, when you go to the haram stuff and you want to study uh, among the ulama, when you want to go to the Jam al umawi and you want to study with the ulama, when you go to different parts of the Muslim world where institutions are there, people ended up setting their kind of colleges and works. So we know from there on early on that these things happened and, and Islam spread and the teaching of Islam spread and, and, and it became very, very entrenched within uh, uh, East African or Northeast African values and, and, and ethos. And therefore uh, many, many, many centers as well as that popped up. And these centers that popped up in terms of education uh, for example, when it comes to, uh, uh, in, 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 for example, um, uh, Ethiopia, modern day Ethiopia, for example, there's quite a few of them in, in, in Wollo. As we know, there are quite a few scholars that come from there, several of them 
recently passed away, some of the Mashaikh from Oromo background, right? And some of um, Mashaikh from uh, um, uh, 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 different backgrounds of, 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 of the world that came from that part of the world and, 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 and contributed to Islamic uh, 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 da'wah and spreading Islam. And, and, and so we have to understand that Islam came to stay and spread, but it was unlike anywhere else, in a way, unlike anywhere else. So within the Arabian Peninsula, Islam were spread through, uh, um, uh, uh, obviously, fighting with, 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 with the clans that were there because they were in opposition with the Prophet Sallallahu The same thing came with Persia, the, uh, the hosts of the companions, they took the battle to Persia. The same thing happened with Byzantine. They took the battle to uh, the, the gates of Europe, right? But when it came to Africa and an instant of Africa, the only place that we can say that this has not happened <laughs> uniquely is Northeast Africa, right? Okay, and, and, and specifically early on the time of the Sahaba. And this is really important. And inshallah, we will leave there. And I know because, you know, there is quite a few uh, probably uh, questions that we will need to go through. And um, I'm going to uh, keep it there. And inshallah, um, yeah, I'll pass the mic on back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Ustaz Muhammad. This has been, um, you know, very, very educational and fascinating. And um, to say the least, uh, I can easily say that it's the most unique Black History Month lesson I've had. Allahumma barik. May Allah increase you in your knowledge. Um, I'll open up to uh, the people who are in the chat to see if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, mashallah. This is so much information uh, to take in. Um, I know. And learn, um, to be honest, you know. Um, uh, for me, it was a lot to take in. But inshallah, I hope this gets recorded where I can go over it and uh, break it down for myself, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Um, if there are no brothers, can I just, uh, if you don't mind, Sheikh, I've, I've got a few comments. Um, it's just, you know, it's just kind of some of my own lessons that I've, uh, on benefits I've got from, from your lecture. Okay. Um, so, subhanAllah, just, uh, you know, with Abraha himself, just seeing him in a different light, um, you know, when you mentioned him apologizing and the event of him uh, mixing his hair with dirt, <laughs> Um, yeah. Often when we're taught the story of um, Ashab al -Feed, we think of Abraha as this arrogant, you know, mm. very, very powerful um, mm. person. But mm -hmm. I'm def I've definitely got a different perspective to that. So Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair, that's, that's uh, one of the things I wanted to say. Um, and also, you know, um, the person you mentioned, uh, Al-Jahiz, when he spoke about the glory of Africans, mm -hmm. um, I thought that was quite remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's something that we need more of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was fair for, for, for you to say that it, it wasn't a racist thing, but mm -hmm. it's just something to, you know, to help uplift and do away with some of the, um, you know, derogatory ideas about Africans at the time. Um, sure. So Jazakallah khair for that as well. Um, something that really stuck with me and I think with anybody who, who listened or will listen, inshallah, when this is posted up on YouTube, um, is the idea and the image of the presence of a lot of North Africans in Mecca. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think everybody falls into is whenever we talk about Mecca and we, we try to, you know, discuss the presence of Africans, like you said, it's just Bilal radiallahu mm. anhu. And to be honest with you, the way that makes me feel is you've got, you know, everybody's Arab and then you've just got Bilal you know, who, who maybe was just brought as a slave, but mm -hmm. there was nothing else. And now to kind of see that there was a whole court, you know, quarter, a whole setup, a whole trade of mm -hmm. Africans, you know, and they've got all of these unique things. It's mm -hmm. just amazing, subhanAllah. 
the question is uh, sorry to interrupt you like oh, uh, what would be the statistically um uh, um the what would be the statistically if there were very mm. few uh, uh people in there um the fact that um uh, the uh, the nurse maid of the prophet sallallahu mm. alaihi wasallam would come from mm. there you know mm. like um one mm. of the first people to accept islam uh, one of the first men to accept islam because bilal is classed as basically the yeah, uh, the yeah. second man to accept islam man okay okay after, after abu bakr but then right? yeah. mm-hmm. because uh, i think it was ali abu bakr and um allahumma uh, sa'an who am i forgetting the first instance of i'm, th- I'm talking about male figures here um subhanallah Oh, I was just about to say Khadija, but obviously you said no for this. No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> the female, obviously. No, there, but in any case, um, there's quite mm. a few um, companions. There is a whole list of companions that come from Ard al-Habasha that became mm. uh, an almost immediately Muslim after the Prophet mm. spread Islam. Some, quite a number others traveled mm. to him to uh, take Islam from him. And then come back mm-hmm. and are somewhat buried. And the story that uh, Najash now where he's buried, there's co- several other companions that are buried that it traces from there. Mm. Okay, so, uh, several right. other, uh, several other, um, uh, um, because these people were um, linked mostly due to trade. And so you right. need you need agents, you need uh, people to showcase mm. your material, you need all of that mm. stuff. And that mm-hmm. happened in, in, in Mecca to specifically when you're talking about clans and people that uh, frequent your land. So this is one of the things that used to happen uh, frequently. And um, another, another point that I would uh, think about is just the sheer amount of people surrounded by the Prophet وسلم, that came from Ard al-Habasha, that came from mm-hmm. uh, Northeast Africa, the Shi amount of them. Like if mm-hmm. I listed, because I've been looking uh, again, every, t- every once in a while I go back into like who, who were these men and women, you know, what were their names and mm-hmm. stuff and what did they do? Mm-hmm. And stuff. Some are not m- widely known, so they're very like mm-hmm. a name, and something, but they know they are from Ard al-Habasha. And some are mm-hmm. very, very and, and some have come from uh, background. So, like for example, one of the famous mi- mixed background is Bilal. No one talks about okay. Bilal. Guy, you know, everybody talks about <laughs> from Ard al Habasha. No, his father is an Arab. His mother <laughs> is, comes from Ard al Habasha. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is this type of things that um, uh, you know. His father was from an Arab client uh, clan. He was also mm-hmm. dark. His father was also dark. But the fact that um, his father was a traditional uh, 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 from the Arab people and Arab uh, peninsula, mm-hmm. you know, and he's mm-hmm. considered constantly as, as the reference for um, uh, Bilal, as the reference from a black man from East Africa or a black man from Ard al Habasha or Ethiopia yes. or whatever. Yes, it's yes. It's a completely wrong image because at the end of the day, Bilal technically, through, uh, uh, if you're looking at the uh, uh, patrilineal, Mm. Should have been an Arab. Mm. You know? He should have, mm. should have belonged that in that line. Subhanallah. You know? Okay, <laughs> their, their, their caste system was such that he was a client uh, tribe, he was a client tribe or something like that. So right. he was not a superior clan or whatever. It was a clan that was part of another clan, and, and that's how they worked at the days. But nonetheless, nonetheless, his mom was the one that came from Ard al Habasha. And mm. so that's why even Abu Dar al Ghafari. When he is insulting Bilal, that whole famous incident about racism. Oh, he says his, his mom. His yes, mom, you son of he's son of. A, he's not insulting his father. He's yes, not insulting yes, yes. Via his father, he's insulting him via his mother. And, 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 and the reason he's doing it is em, em, is an emphasis that is extra because you know, mm. you, you 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 your father uh, might be black or whatever you know because he says the what he says the. The son of a black woman, right? Of a black woman, so, yeah. He's also the son of a black man because we said father was black, right? But right. the blackness here that's at, um, uh, uh, used to describe the woman here, the, the, the mm. mother, is mm. done in a derogatory term because Habash or the people from Habash or Ard al-Habasha to mm. them was uh, a, a very, um, uh, how do Insult. you say it? 
yeah, an insult at the time right. and slightly period uh, that pe uh, period uh, because the different caste system. And the reason That's that they're a different caste right. system is obviously these people a economically and 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 politically they came to invade us a while ago. So we still right. remember they took up a huge uh, of our land. They took a lot of uh, business, labor and stuff. So you're not gonna like anybody that invades you. You're not gonna have, like, no. look, um, look, at, look at today. Till today, we talk about when it comes to Africa, um, uh, the colonials, we talk about the right. Europe and what Africa has done, right? Mm. And so mm. our generation and the ne next generation are writing the history and they mm. go by what we say, the achievements- They're that, not gonna be very nice, yeah. No, no, yeah. they're not gonna be nice. And yeah. so this, despite though, despite European hegemony being much more superior at the time, technologically, mm. everything else. So it does not reflect their ability of then is it will reflect what we will say down the line and pass on no. to future generations. No, so that no, is no. similar thing. Subhanallah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Oh, subhanallah. Um, I've got such a long list of, you know, different things we can go into, but I, I you know, I, um, I've yeah. got sympathy for you because you've spoken for so long. Um, yeah. So, you know, just a few other things that I thought were, were quite remarkable. Um, you know, just, just you mentioning um, the, and Najesh, so himself, his trials at, right at the start, um, mm -hmm. you know, being sold into slavery and what his uncle and um, the clergy and everybody else did and that mm -hmm. trial he went through. Mm -hmm. And it being such a nice narrative i don't mean the story itself is nice but you, like the way it comes across and the different things that happen it felt like it was on par with shakespeare you know mm. i felt like it you know it was it was, <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. it would make a really good you know bedtime story for you know children. shakespeare uh, copied a lot of material uh, there's a sub different subject oh. obviously but he mm. copied a lot of material from um uh, modern day spain islam Right, and, right, and, right, and a lot of, a lot of the, uh, and a lot of his, quote unquote, ingenious um, hmm. uh, uh, material, and a lot of his plays, you can see constantly, Muslim figures in there as well. You know, a lot of his hmm. plays and a lot of his art, and so, so hmm. Shakespeare is not divorced from uh, Islamic influence and Muslims and and the way gotcha. we tell stories. So you know, who knows? He gets all of his ideas from you know. <laughs> looking at the hadiths and the seras and everything else, you know? Allah yep, yep, yep. Allah alam. I got you, I got you, I got you. Um, and, okay, I'll, I'll skip everything and just, and just um, get get to the last thing that, that was quite um, memorable for me. Um, you know, the verse you mentioned at the end about the people of the book and how they become humble when they hear the Quran mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, authentic the sources of tafsir and you know people that are reliable um, mm -hmm. mufas they themselves describe that as referring to al najashi mm -hmm. i think hearing that as a as a muslim and as maybe a, specifically a black muslim or mm -hmm. a black african muslim it, it it makes a whole difference you know mm -hmm. it's not just now you've you've also got these these other things that come around the story of al najashi it's not just you know what we see in like, you know, we spoke on the phone um, mm -hmm. about the, the, the movie, The Message. And mm -hmm. you just have, you know, that little short clip um, about Najashi. And yeah, uh, you don't really have much to kind of celebrate. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that was such an amazing thing to hear. Yeah, this is the, the thing is, um, uh, if you look at just purely statistics and numbers. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. move away from the idea that uh, non-Muslims and other historians and stuff, and they just... They, they just think this is semantics, the stuff that we're talking about, mm. because to them, mm. it's like it's only reported by Muslims. So mm. therefore, mm. You know, we don't have anything contemporary wise that can put this narrative into. And one of the things I didn't mention is, you know, one of the most uh, important contentions are his name and how you spell it. Ashama mm. Ibn Abjar and that sort of thing. No. And it's been said that the guy who is contemporary to him, the, 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 the ruler, the Najashi, Ila Gabas, if you the form kind of the way you pronounce it as an Arab, for example, it would mm. look like instead of Al-Ashama, mm. okay, or instead of Al-Ashama, Ilah-Shama. Okay. 
So it's kind mm. of a bit of deformation that has happened probably from the Giz language, which is mm. modern day, uh, uh, what the modern day uh, Tigrania and, and, and Amharic languages developed from, which are mm. Semitic mm. languages. And Semitic languages, obviously, right. Judaic, Arabic, mm. um, uh, the, what we call those Ethiopic languages, the Tigrania and Amharic languages, they are one and the same in terms of root. Okay, they mm -hmm. just have different different ways. So that was already shows us already like you know ways of interpreting, but also is an exp an, a sort of a perch happened where, you know, this figure and his achievement and who he was was not mm. being appreciated and was not told. It was happening mm. as we said in the story as while he was a young child, he was no. being persecuted and chased away from his rule because of who he was and his moral characters, and mm. his story. Ethiopian historians today, like uh, uh, Tamrat, for example, whose work I just quoted earlier, he talks about and he mentions, and many others talk about and mentions that several uh, Najashis or several kings in Ethiopian uh, um, or uh, Christian Ethiopian history have yeah. been completely wiped off from uh, from the book because of their it's attitude. Deliberately. Towards Deliberately, yeah, their attitude oh, no. towards maybe sometimes Islam, sometimes towards um, uh, uh, Islamization. They had mm. some, some of them were kind of be lenient, several of them were uh, suspected of being secret Muslims, you know. <laughs> right, so don't want people knowing that. <laughs> no, not enough people know that. And some mm. of them actually said, I love Muslims. And the latest was Ilyasu, uh, who was a very um, very problematic figure. He had a, a <laughs> lot of things to say about Muslims and being Muslim and whatnot. Right. But he also had, had also he 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 was kind of two faced type of uh, leader. But mm. for most of the time, he loved the Muslims and he got into know. trouble. They sort of, and this is uh, in the 1770s, I think. I'm not 1770s. Mm -hmm. No, 80s. Sorry, 80s something. Okay. Right. And so he no no 80s 80s 90s till early 90s something. So he uh, had a problem uh, um, uh, himself because, you know, he, he, he kind of had an ambition or an idea uniting the Horn of Africa to a greater extent. And he could do that by intermarrying with Muslim women, by saying, I'm a Muslim, I'm a lenient, sort of, I'm, I'm acceptable to Islam and Muslims. And then he got, you know, excommunicated by uh, the, mm. you know, by the um, the church, you know. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's very, it's very funny how these things happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, Subhanallah. Um, well, I've got a few more questions and a few more comments, but I I can't do this to you, Sheikh. You've, you've spoken for so long. Um, Go ahead. Let's do what we can. I, okay. So I will I will ask you this one. Um, right. So what? What would you say are the top three things to teach our children about a Najashi? You know, kind of for those of us who maybe do homeschooling or I know it's, it's such a big topic, um, yeah. but just something brief that maybe parents can take away from this, this lecture, inshallah. I think the, the, the best lesson, and I think we should, uh, beside that, uh, just also, as it falls within uh, your question, I think, mm. is that we should have, we, A, we should develop resources, not just tell things, but we should right. develop Muslim uh, historical resources that are conscious of the black narrative or the African mm. narrative or the African contribution, because there are none. There might mm. be here one or two, which mm. fall under um, under the general uh, general theme just of Muslim black. contributions, right? right. But there right. are no uh, 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 stories that are being told from a black or African Muslims perspective specifically. Yes. They are not the central piece. So uh, mm. and you, you're talking about Najashi, for example, you're talking mm. about um, uh, Mansa Musa, you're talking about, mm. you're talking about hosts of people that, you know, if you, different parts of Africa, if you mention their names, no one knows. And these yeah. two names are probably the most famous households and household names when it comes to kings who were Muslims from Africa, no. like Mansa no. Musa and as well as uh, 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 the Najashi, right? No. But even those figures with such a uh, history, with mm. so much um, contribution out there, where where is their story? <laughs> you would imagine volumes and volumes. No, and there is none. So what do you think about? 
the average uh, king what do you think about the average of sheikh course. what do you think about the average uh, uh, scholar of of uh, like everything i come across when i'm researching i come across this figure and that figure and i'm like i'm right. digging it and then i'm i'm looking trying to connect the dots with who who they live with who were their contemporaries what did they do right. what did they teach? who did they teach and i just yeah. every time a mom bubbled how they are senior to the most celebrated muslim scholars that of we course. know they are they contemporaries the they are contemporaries to salahuddin al ayyubi they are contemporaries to shamsuddin al dahabi ibn hajar asqalani and they are contemporaries and, and teachers of imam al shafii i mean like where, where are these people where nah, are these nah, 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 nah. so we need to develop beyond Business. we should go actually beyond the question of what parents should do and teach i right. think we should develop resources mm-hmm. okay uh for children as well as uh for adults but absolutely for children that is around teaching um the the islamic history and the heritage of muslims from the uh continent right no, and what no. they did and how they no. advanced islam and what their contribution were yes i study sahih al bukhari because mashallah sahih al bukhari you know i know who imam al bukhari is I know we study Imam Bukhari because we've got the the second we the the, the be- second best uh, uh, authoritative work that we have in Islam because of its correctness is 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 comes from this collection of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam hadiths right and so we know but do we know their teachers who they were do they do we know these people that they travel to get hadiths from and who they came from like how many bukhari did you have uh, east africans as teachers how many africans uh, how many uh, uh, people from ard al habasha did he uh, narrate from and collect hadiths from or from uh, uh, generally uh, that part of the area we don't so and th- this is all lost in a, in a vacuum and i think we should actually yeah we should do something about it inshallah just develop resources that's mm. my short answer we should develop is that fair children for example you know no 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 Yeah. Subhanallah. I think that that would be you know something that will, will be transformative inshallah. Um I will I will, I will stop here. Um and also because of time as well we don't want it to be uh, too long for our listeners inshallah. Um but um my brothers and sisters you can find more of Ustaz Muhammad's work uh, available on YouTube um as I've been spying on him myself. um as well as his personal media pages as well so please check it out there's a lot of benefit from there um we also want to you know thank you again ustaz jazakallah kullu khair may Allah reward you abundantly um we also want to thank the brothers and sisters who worked hard to make this event possible um we want to thank everyone who attended and everybody who's going to watch it um on the live stream or once it's uploaded inshallah and you know we hope that you received some benefit from this um and inshallah you take it away and and, you, and it can make a difference in your lives inshallah please don't forget to visit the islamophobia awareness month and men website there's a lot of campaigns happening in november inshallah um and all of us can get involved in our own ways you know whether it's volunteering or donating and so on uh, jazakumullah kullu khair for tuning in sheikh again jazakallah kullu khair inshallah we hope to see you again um in some kind of event inshallah in the future بين الله كريم بارك الله فيك نور الدين فيك بارك الله سلام الله سوري اي كول جي نور الدين عفوا اي هاف هيز نيم هير اي هاف هيز نيم هيز فيس ام ماي باسورد ماي نيم از ام كا يو كي ذاتس ماي نيم يا واتس يور نيم ديد شي سي اي سيد نو ام جوك اند اي سيد اي سيد ماي نيم از ام كا يو كي ذاتس ذاتس ذا نيم اوف ذا ذس تشانو Ah yeah okay I'm going to look yeah, it up if yeah, it's yeah, still yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> Jazakallah <laughs> khair jaza. Allahu uh, amin Sheikh Allahu amin. And uh, may Allah uh, reward you guys for doing all this khair and khidma bi idnillah kareem and I hope it's been uh, beneficial for everybody. Barakallahu fikum. Allahu amin. Allahu amin. Allahu amin. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.